Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a NAD and the model number is C300. In terms of general specifications, continuous power output is 25 watts per channel times 2. This increases to 45 watts per channel for the dynamic power output if you have an 8 ohm speaker load. And then again dynamic power output 70 watts per channel for 4 ohm connected speakers and this increases then to 90 watts if you connect 2 ohms again dynamic power output. Total harmonic distortion is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and that's 0.03%. And then input sensitivity for your disc, CD, video, aux tuner tape 1 and tape 2 is 200 millivolts with an impedance of 20 kilo ohms. As in many amplifiers, you have the ability to turn off the tone control circuit, so that is via the tone defeat switch at the front. You also have an headphone socket, so that's a core inch jack for private listening. And the weight of the amplifier is 5.4 kilograms. And then dimensions, height, width and depth, 8435, 285 millimeters. And the amplifier was also provided with a remote control. But just remember that this, this remote control is only used for the selection of the volume, increase or decrease, or to place the amplifier into mute. It will not select any of the inputs. These are all mechanical switches. Now, when this amplifier came into the workshop, when you put the amplifier on to test, what you found was poor audio quality. So kind of flat, and then I would say no sort of range to it. And then also as well, when you remove the top cover, this amplifier didn't smell good. And what I'm referring to is that it indicated that potentially capacitors had already vented and there was been some form of electrolyte which had come out of the capacitors. So this amplifier required a complete recap. Now, that's not surprising. And the reason why I say that is this particular series of amplifier, which is the C-Class. If you had, for example, the C320, that again is a very, very common amplifier. And then what you find is, and what you can see now, what I'm showing you, this is the startup circuit board. And what you can see, and what I'm indicating, is one of the capacitors which is vented. You can also make out at the side the brand name, which is JH. Now, on all of the tutorials which I've done, I refer to this brand of capacitor and again if you went to the landing site for this channel and you use the search function you would probably find that there are extensive repair videos not with the tutorial but where I've done recaps and I always refer to this brand of capacitor and they always fail so if you're looking to refurbish any of these amplifiers you're going to pretty much have to do a recap I do appreciate that if you go online you can get repair kits and they'll tell you to change the main smoothing capacitors but they all pretty well aged about the same so as I say they all need replacing. What I would say as well is recapping an amplifier is not something you can do at a very very low price. So all the capacitors that you're going to see which have been installed into this amplifier are Panasonic and the only ones which are different are the main smoothing electrolytics where I've fitted Rubicon. If you go and try and source maybe a lower cost capacitor, more likely you're going to come across capacitors which are coming in from China and often they will be very low quality or in some cases they will indicate that they are premium brand Japanese capacitors and what you'll find is they're fake. They're not actually as they're being sold. So what you need to do is always to source the capacitors from reputable suppliers and of course fit, if you can, brand named Japanese capacitors and that will give you some longevity in terms of performance of the amplifier and also overall you know it's going to be a quality repair. What you don't want to be doing is really trying to cut corners on this because if you do then you know you hear it within the audio quality it's not going to be as good and then of course you won't have the life expectancy for the amplifier. Now just to give you an indication there's approximately 30 capacitors the electrolytics inside of this amplifier that needed to be replaced. And in the UK, these were sourced from CPC, which is an electronic supplier, part of the Farnell group. And the cost, including shipping, came up to about £38. Now, this is what I would term as an entry-level amplifier. So if you take the cost of the components and then you add in your own labour cost, you could come to the point where it's just not cost-effective. And you sometimes get that. For myself, I get contacted by people and they'll ask like, to recap an amplifier, and I'm quite happy to do that. But normally they're driven more around sentimental value of the amplifier. So the cost of the parts and the labour really doesn't come into it. They just want to have the amplifier restored and then listen to it again. If you're going to go and source maybe from auction websites, 
it's again a commercial decision that you make whether or not you want to restore it and if it's going to be cost effective particularly if you're not going to use it for your own use and maybe you're planning then to resell it so what you can see next this is that circuit board which you saw a moment ago and what you find there is the bridge rectifiers the electrolytic smoothing capacitors and then what you'll also see as well is the solder side of the board which you see here and what i've done is you can see some of the capacitor leads on one of the electrolytics hasn't been cut off yet the reason why i'm showing you the solder side if this amplifier is dating back to you know sort of 1999 2000 or 2001 you need to look at all of the solder joints because most of them which have stress or they are heat related components which are dissipating heat you will always get dry joints and we'll see that later as we go through so as with all of these amplifiers you have this service hatch so there's a series of screws that you remove and then once you've done that what you can now see is the solder side of the circuit board and as always and i always mention this you do need to inspect all of these solder joints and then what I've done next is I've just simply removed from the circuit board the electrolytic capacitors and these are the large electrolytics. These are 10,000 microfarads at 50 volts. Now straight away what you can see and this looks like leakage of electrolyte but it isn't. This is where they've used this glue and this is very very common for all of these amplifiers not just now but all brands of this time era and they've used it for mechanical reinforcement but unfortunately what happens with the glue is first of all it dries out it becomes almost like a hard lacquer but it has two other properties that manifest the first one is it's corrosive and then the other one as well is it becomes conductive and what you'll need to do is use a plastic label removal tool that's what i use and then carefully remove this lacquer okay you can see in some cases it is touching some component leads and then what I'm showing you and what I've circled is one of the dry joints. So this is on a power component on the amplifier board. And what you can see is it has become discolored and there's also cracking around there. So just take your time, make sure that you inspect each of the solder joints and re-solder any that you see like this. But again, when you're doing the work, just make sure you don't accidentally have a solder bridge. Normally the amplifier would be laid flat. You know, you don't really want to sort of have it maybe in the vertical plane and then start soldering because there'll be accumulation of solder on your soldering iron. And the last thing you want is maybe you didn't notice, but it just drips down and that solder will connect two connections which shouldn't be made. Now, when you do the recapping, I always say this is make the time and take the time. It's something that you do not want to rush. The first thing that you've got to do, of course, is to remove the capacitor. But when you install the new capacitor, you need to make sure of a number of things. First of all, the polarity, and it will be marked on the circuit board which one is the negative, and you need to make sure that it goes in correctly. The other thing that you need to be aware of as well when you're doing this is once you've completed all of the recap, you need to check each one of those capacitors just to make sure that you didn't accidentally insert any capacitor the wrong way around. The other thing is as well is that within this amplifier, like many amplifiers, you have the value in microfarads of the capacitor and then you have the voltage rating. Now for cost reasons, of course, what they would do is if the circuit didn't require maybe a 47 microfarad capacitor at 50 volts and maybe only required to be 16 volts, that's what they fitted. If you go like for like voltage matching the original, you could accidentally get some of those capacitors mixed up. For myself, if a capacitor maybe is rated at 63 volts, modern day capacitors are often smaller than the original, so there's no issue then to fit them in. But just be careful. And then the other part is, if for example you have 4.7 microfarad capacitor, and you have 47 microfarad capacitors, again, you may accidentally mix them up, so just verify that you've got the correct capacitor and what you're fitting. Now, on this amplifier, what you have are these preamp modules and you would have seen that earlier when we had the overview part just after the introduction in the video you what you can see are these sort of compartments which are mounted vertically and inside of there are these preamp modules and one of course for each channel the reason why i'm highlighting is that there are two electrolytic capacitors on there and they're quite small but you will need to replace them because they're the same brand and of course they will have deteriorated and then what you have is just a single fixing screw and you can just see to the right hand side there's a small metal heat sink and what that does is it just clamps those two power transistors via an insulating washer to the metal casing that this module slides into and then this is the solder side of course and again what you need to do is just to verify that none of those solder joints are bad 
If they are, you know what to do. You have to resolder and make sure that you check in even the pins and then also the individual connections. And then these are the new electrolytic capacitors. Now, for any of you who have eagle eyes, what you'll actually notice is there is an error. And the error here is, is that those capacitors have been incorrectly installed the wrong way around. Now that's on me, right? So I was aware of it. So when I turned the board over, I quickly had a look and I could see, oh, and I made a mistake and I popped them in the wrong way around. So rather than install it incorrectly, then I've just simply desoldered the capacitors and put them the right way around. The reason why I mention it is that often within the tutorials, it may come across the, you know, everything just goes smoothly. You never have any issues and you never make any mistakes. That's not the case. This is just really all encompassing to show you, you know, the methodology with regard to these repairs. But everything or every mistake you make, then you learn something from it. And as I always say, you just need to keep on checking your work. Make sure at each stage you do that. Now, the speaker protection relay is a very, very common failure point on all audio amplifiers that use this type of technology to protect the speaker. So you have a speaker protection circuit. And in the event, for example, will detect a high DC output on either of the channels or both. Then the relay then will de-energize and disconnect the audio output channels from the speakers. Now, these contacts become worn. And they also become oxidized then you get distortion and you also get intermittent loss of sound so in this case we simply replace the relay 24 volt coil double pole change of and then what you'll also need to do is to remove the front fascia because what you have to get access to is this circuit board here and you can see that it refers to it as a display board well kind of but more so what you can see is that that is the microcontroller the silver device underneath the black IC is the crystal and then what I've done here is I've just circled two capacitors and so these are two electrolytic capacitors that you need to replace as well. You can also see the banks of switches and these will require cleaning with deoxit just to ensure that you have noise free operation and then what you also see as well is the potentiometers so these potentiometers here are used for your base treble and balance controls and you'll also need to spray into there deoxid and then just work them backwards and forwards multiple times until you have no noise. And then you can just make out there's one small electrolytic capacitor just on the right hand side of that board. And then you also have the tone defeat switch as well. And make sure that you check all of the solder joints. And also when you remove the front fascia and the metal chassis part, what you'll also get access to is the headphone socket and then also the on off switch. So again, resolder all of those connections. Now, once that has all been done, the next part to do is the alignment of the amplifier. So like all of the tutorials, you can now see that I've put an extract of the service manual and this is showing the left channel. And the things that you are interested in is, first of all, you need to adjust the DC offset and the preset potentiometers are right next to each one of those preamplifier vertical modules. And then what you will be doing is you'll be connecting your multimeter to the rear terminals of the amplifier. Now there are test points for the DC offset on the circuit board, but they're really close together and you've got to use hot clips and such like. For me, I've just connected to the rear terminals, but maybe if you were testing the amplifier and the speaker protection relay wasn't energizing, then you can use those test points just to verify that you don't have a high DC offset. For me, the relay was changing over. I didn't have high DC offset and I'm purely doing the alignment. So you leave the amplifier probably running for about 20 minutes no speakers connected, no inputs, and then your user controls for your bass, treble and balance will be set at midpoint and your volume at minimum. And then you measure, as I said, across the speaker terminals. And what you're looking to do is to adjust it to as close to zero millivolts as you possibly can. And you have a tolerance of plus and minus 30 millivolts. And then once that is done, of course, you repeat for the other channel. And then the final adjustment is to set the idling current and what you can see is that the output from this particular amplifier uses MOSFETs. So we are looking to set the idle current across the test point which is across the diode and you have a range of 160 to 180 millivolts. So you can see that now in operation so you can just kind of make out just at the edge of this screen my multimeter leads connected to the speaker terminals and you can see that it's very very low at 0 0.24 millivolts. And then here for the left channel, I've done the adjustment and then that now is down at 0 0.43 millivolts. So very, very low. And then 
here what I'm doing is I'm connecting across the diode. Now it says minus, okay, I can reverse my leads around to get a positive value, but you can see that there was no requirement for adjustment. It was 175 millivolts, which was fine. And then here for the other channel, you can see 174 millivolts. So in terms of recapping, it's probably going to take you maybe three hours, I would say, to do all of the work. But once you've done that, what I will say is it does produce an exceptionally high quality sound. And then here you can see all of the different electrolytic capacitors that have been taken out. And then also the speaker protection relay as well. And then as we draw to a close for this repair tutorial, I just zoomed in so you can see the toroidal transformer, which has a metal shield around it. And just to the rear of the amplifier, you can see the brand new Panasonic capacitors installed. Also as well, the circuit board was cleaned, as you can see here, because there's quite a lot of residue on there. And then the amplifier, of course, is put into test. And it will probably run for about four hours, as I said in many of the tutorials. And then once that is done, then the amplifier, of course, can then be boxed and then returned back to the customer. So I really appreciate you stopping by. And if you need any help, assistance or guidance, by all means, email audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com. And I'll be happy to come back to you and provide any support that you may require. So until the next time, I wish you all the very best. Cheers and bye bye.